Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the Twins. Men for the Win is sponsored by The Grand Group with Edina Realty. Are you looking to purchase a new home in the Twin Cities area? Or perhaps you're trying to sell your current home? Whether you're upsizing or downsizing, The Grand Group with Edina Realty will meet all of your housing needs. Contact The Grand Group by emailing the Grand G-R-A-N, group at edinarealty.com or call them by phone at 612-817-8751. The Grand Group with Edina Realty, three-time Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine Super Agent Award winners. On this episode, David and Dan recap the Twins' last series that meant anything for the season against the Cleveland Guardians. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win. My name is David Kupas. With me, as always, is Dan Thompson. The Twins managed to steal one, one whole game (laughs) from the Guardians, Dan. One whole game in a five-game series that really was the season for the Twins. If they did not win, likely four of five, the season was over. and, And Dan, the Twins will still be playing baseball, but none of those games will mean much. I would like them to finish above 500. I think that would be a nice ending because also because that's kind of what we all predicted. We thought this was a 500 team. I think it's just frustrating that so much of this comes down to injuries, certainly, but it's just the potential of the team was there. And again, there is something to be said about the team being entertaining up to this point, right? Like they've made it through almost the entire season and we've cared. I know, but part of me almost wants to take that back. Like in a sense that like, oof, yes, meaningful baseball, but so many heartbreaks over the last four a couple months really right i mean since they were they had a great start kind of in april and may and they've been a a sub 500 team for most of the year well especially against teams that are just better right like like, i mean it's just clear their holes have been shown when they play the yankees when they play the dodgers when they play the astros when you play those top tier teams this team is not going to compete with them and so even if you make the postseason i mean hogs always asks this question right would you rather lose before you get to the postseason or would you rather lose to the yankees in the first round again uh, it's just been such a hard <laughs> season it's really hard to answer that question now with when the wound is so raw david because this was a series of the twins again we said this before they could have had this series kufus They really could have. Well, maybe. What do you mean? I mean that they really could have won four of these five. And there's not a lot of question in my mind that like there were winnable games at the table. The only one that really wasn't that didn't feel at all close was game two. Every other game like they led in those games. Okay, this does get to something that I've written here, because here's the thing. Whenever we play the Yankees, right, it just feels inevitable that the Yankees are going to win. And the Yankees are the only team that I've ever had that feeling about. That, like, something freak is going to happen. The Yankees are going to hit four home runs in a row or something. Like, even if the Twins are up ten runs, just feels like the Twins are going to lose whenever they play the Yankees. And the Guardians, Dan, are not the Yankees. The AL Central is a trash division this year. And I hate, I hate, Dan, playing these games against the Guardians and just assuming the Twins are going to lose and it's inevitable. That should not be the case for the Cleveland Guardians, Dan. No, but there's something about Terry Francona. There's something about this Guardians team that I think they've had a lot of injuries too, right? Especially on the pitching staff. They've lost a couple of their top starters and they've kind of found a way and managed. And you know what they do? They do the little things. They advance runners. They take bases. Um, This was made on the telecast here in game five today that like they probably have won more games than the Twins and the White Sox simply because they're a more aggressive base running team. Like it's just, it's interesting how it can come down to just one of those tools so clearly. And, and the Guardians are just so much better at that. Listening to the to Provis and, and Gladden, man, you could tell that they're like, oh, this is going to be a rough couple of weeks here. Well, anyway, we should go into this here. We got a lot of games to talk about, David. Series recap. Do we have to? We I do. We, we do. Because here's the thing. Game one had such promise. The Twins lose this 4-3, to three, but they led 3 nothing going into the bottom of the seventh. David, Bailey Ober comes back, which I was nervous, right, about him coming back. Are we going to see a Mally situation where he makes a couple innings and then he's done? But he goes five, really solid, one hit, one walk, five strikeouts. They were obviously going to keep him on a bit of a leash, but 70 pitches is not nothing, especially when we're used to guys getting pulled at 60 and 50. That's like an Archer Bundy outing exactly. right there right yeah, um, one of those barcher starts here but yeah, <laughs> neither neither offense is stellar but the guardian struggled with opportunities and the twins just simply didn't have any in this game dan no they didn't and man nick gordon just i mean it was a costly error that he had the twins again they're one for three with runners in the scoring position not a lot of chances of course jake cave has a home run right like they did enough still if you just had a little bit more in the back end of your bullpen but the back end of this bullpen has been so used over the course of the season and i wonder how much that contributed here 
here that they just they're just running out of gas it very well could be i mean the saddest part about this game is the winning run for cleveland was scored on a wild pitch that the guy was at second i think that's the part that makes this obviously the most frustrating is that normally if i told you that a guy scored on a wild pitch you'd say oh from third no second base dan so sanchez loses a ball that duran it was a back foot slider sanchez lost it it goes all the way to the backstop and sanchez doesn't have a clue where it is and by the time sanchez gets to the ball urshel is covering home but Stephen kwan has already rounded third and basically just waltzes on home to score the winning run Stephen kwan is another one of those guys that i feel like he's going to be haunting the twins for a long long time if he didn't play for a team the twins saw so frequently i would be a big fan because i I like the way he plays baseball there's a little bit of an ichiro in him well and i so you did mention jake cave and here's the thing jake cave has been a feature on this podcast a lot dan and i will say there are things that you have said over the seasons that have made me you know not jump for joy about jake cave but you've always kind of been in jake cave's corner except except in the postseason appearance where kirilov comes up as a rookie (laughs) But other than that, you've always been Jake Cave. Totally. Guy. And I was Big I was the fan. Jake Cave defender when it came to that postseason start for Kirillov. But Dan, I've never been in Jake Cave's corner. And I got to be honest with you, I think he's won me over, Dan. And I want him <laughs> on this team as a utility guy. And as we mentioned last podcast, he's likely going to be on this team until we die. He doesn't he already look kind of 50 years old right yes. with that beard? It's a, it's a lot of gray in that beard. Yeah, well, let's go to game two. This one, Dan, I don't even know how much we need to talk about. Guardians win this one 5-1. to one. Varland makes his second start. If you remember, he made a start against the Yankees. And granted, it was a depleted Yankee lineup, but he had a very good outing. This was the opposite of that he goes five innings pitched four earned runs two walks three strikeouts and a home run given up that brings his season era to 5.23 however in typical Rocco fashion managing the loss well Aaron Sanchez pitches the final three innings of the game and the twins get out of this one only using two pitchers it's great when you only have to pitch eight innings on the, in a road loss like this I mean Rocco yeah. must love these moments right <laughs> all right great I got one more inning and again when you're going against Shane Bieber he goes eight innings six strikeouts he does give up one home run to Matt Walner in his debut and I guess that was literally the only positive that came out of this baseball game for the Twins. Yeah, there's really nothing else to talk about in Game 2. So let's just go ahead and go into Game 3. This was a doubleheader, so this was Game 2 was the first game of the doubleheader, and then Game 3 was the second game of the doubleheader. And the the teams had already played a lot of baseball. And Game 3 goes to 15 innings, which is the longest in the MLB uh, this season. That was really remarkable. It is so hard to not score runs when you have that runner at second for as long as they did. I mean, like, it wasn't like this was a game that that went into extras three to three. Like, it was five five after the Twins rallied in the eighth, which credit them there, right, for not rolling over. The the Twins really have not rolled over in that sense. They have just totally run out of stamina um, as a team. And, you know, so there's the Twins and the Guardians both score one in the 13th. But that's it until the bottom of the 15th when the Guardians finally push one across. Honestly, you could tell that this Twins team knew that if they lost this game, the season was over. Like, that's the only reason this game progressed was because the Twins knew that, hey, if we lose this game, that's basically all she wrote for us. And I love extra inning games because they give you some ridiculous stat lines because there's so many at-bats. So I love the runners in scoring position numbers, which (laughs) is also hilarious because you start with the runner at second, obviously, in extra innings. So the Twins go three for 21 with runners in scoring position, and the Guardians Guardians go six for 28. I don't know that I have ever seen a team with 28 at bats with runners in scoring position. That is ridiculous. And the funniest thing about this, Dan, is, you know, Dan and I each create our notes separately and then we add them onto the spreadsheet. And I was literally going to the spreadsheet to write that note and you had already put it in. And I'm like, (laughs) okay, I can tell why we're friends. But the other note I wanted to point out here is that Quan, again, who is just a name we're going to be constantly talking about, like you mentioned, Dan. So he scores from second on a single to left. Here's what happens. So Hamilton, Billy Hamilton, I got to clarify here. (laughs) So so I got (laughs) to clarify which Hamilton it is. (laughs) Billy Hamilton's in left field and Hamilton throws home. And so that holds Quan at third base. And Sanchez then has the ball at home and he throws to second base and then doesn't pop up and go back and cover home. So nobody's at home. So Quan just waltzes on home again. It's like, that's the same thing. Every single game, Dan, you see Stephen Quan just waltzing his way down the baseline, just touching home plate. He's on the Sunday afternoon stroll, Dan. The Twins are trying to play defense. And you got Quan just whistling while he works on his way down the baseline. And, and that is one thing about this Twins team is I think this might come up a little bit later, but there are some fundamentals and some baseball smarts that I think have been lacking on this team. And maybe it's because maybe that's been exacerbated just simply because they've been in so many maddening games where they've lost leads late but it just feels like there's a mental break 
down a little bit with this baseball team in moments like that. Well, I think part of that does have to come down to management. I think right? so. Like, it's yeah. been very clear that Rocco has a very lax approach when it comes to players and preparation. And he says, you know, they're professionals. They know what they need to do. Well, there comes a point there, Rocco, where you can't have guys sleeping in the clubhouse anymore and you need to be hitting <laughs> grounders to them. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's save a little bit more of that for Rocco's Rewind. I did want to point out one other thing. Derek Rodriguez came in um, as I think he was the 29th guy in the baseball game or something like that. <laughs> but he gave him almost four innings in extras there to keep them in the game. And I know he got pinned with the loss. No earned runs in, in extras for him. But you got to credit the guy for coming out there and eating some innings when they really needed him to. We do have to mention how the game ends is Palacios playing shortstop. I mean, it's a it's a one hop grounder. This is not a difficult play to make. I assumed it was an easy out and he just lets the ball go right by him. So a terrible way to end the game. And the funniest thing about this, Dan, if you go on MLB.com and you look at the highlights for this game, the longest game of the MLB season, Dan, the shortest highlights, the highlights for this game was <laughs> two minutes and 39 seconds. Dan. It was 15 innings of baseball. It was, probably, goodness. it was probably really late at night and the guys were just ready to go home and they just were waiting for the game-winning run. Everything else was done. They just wanted to attack on that final play. Well, and do they not have the technology to extend the box score? It really you, bothers me when I'm pacing the center. It's like, well, you really only get the seventh inning on. It's like, excuse <laughs> me? Like, did they not play those first six innings? Uh, all right, well, let's go to game four. The Again, the bright spot, the Twins win. Joe Ryan has a fantastic start after a no-hitter, nearly, for seven innings, I suppose. Well, it was a no-hitter. It was a no-hitter for <laughs> the, seven innings. The way you phrased that was quite entertaining, Dan, because you, <laughs> depending where you cut that, it certainly would seem as though you said that Joe Ryan threw, threw a no-hitter. Well, I tell you what, because it was pointed out on Twitter, he, he didn't give up any hits in his first couple innings. So he did go nine consecutive innings without giving up a hit. But, of course, that didn't much matter. He he was only the second Twins pitcher, I can't believe this, but I can, uh, to throw into the eighth inning. Uh, Bundy did it actually at a game that I was at in Arizona in June, but that is, if if anything is indicative of the Twins' struggles with starting pitching, I think it's that stat. Another note here, Arise gets thrown out at home. Again, I'm not exactly sure if this is on Watkins. It probably is. It was probably. a sack fly attempt, but Arise is thrown out again by a solid five or six feet, and Arise's attempt at a slide was maybe the most awkward thing <laughs> I have seen on a baseball team diamond in quite some time it was like he was kneeling like he wasn't really trying to slide it's like he was gonna propose to the catcher that was his plan of action i think um luckily it doesn't matter so arise actually comes up with a huge hit late in the game uh with the bases loaded to knock in a couple late runs which anytime you're going against the guardians it's nice to have a couple extra runs there at the end yeah see that's what i don't like i don't like that we need to say that well, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, it, it yeah. just bothers me that it's it, that for whatever reason this season, the Guardians seem to have our number. Well, and it was there's a lot of ridiculous stats you can find on Twitter about this season series. But I believe they were even on on runs in the series. It was 89 apiece or something like that. And the Guardians won 13 of them. That's that's about the way that odds should break for Minnesota sports. Usually last thing we should mention is Palacios had another error. Uh, so his fifth of the season, he's only played like 15 games. I know I, his fielding percentage. I texted this to you. There should be a, there's a Mendoza line for batting of 200. I don't know what the fielding percentage line is, but that is the Palacios line, certainly. Maybe 800 or something like yeah. that? <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And then game five, you know, at this point, the twin season is, is over. Uh, essentially right they're coming into this game they're six pack they show some pluck they lose this game 11 to 4 but they had every opportunity really to come back into this game you're chuckling but like in the sixth inning they really had a chance to take the lead after falling behind four nothing they did but dan if there was ever a game played by a team that had lost all hope this was definitely it i mean lopez is sitting up there just chucking balls at batters he just doesn't even care at the end of that game he's literally aiming he is he is so poor dan by the time he got to the twins that he can't even hit guys when he's trying to. <laughs> Well, and you know what the great irony of this is that he is relieved by Palacios in the bottom of the eighth to get the final out of the game, or at least get the final out of the Guardians, of course, because it's an eighth inning, so Rocco doesn't have to trot anybody out for the ninth. Um, no, did two, Palacios you know, had any wild pitches? He was trying to up those numbers, I guess. <laughs> one more error, one more error. Gray exits with an injury, and granted that matters way less now because it's not like he's going to factor into the postseason, but maybe that'll give him time to get healthy for next season. So one other note I want to make, I feel terrible 
scramble about this. I couldn't figure out which game it was in, but there was a play where Cleveland had runners on, on first and third, and there was a sharp ball hit to Urshela, who was playing close to the bag, and he made a remarkable play where he fielded the ball and tagged the runner. I think it was Straw who was on third who got tagged out, but just a fantastic play by Urshela. And granted, I know that he's been up and down. In big moments, he either does the best thing or the worst thing. There's rarely any in-between with him. But I do wonder what his role will be on this team next season. But you can you can't doubt that that man makes some remarkable plays in the field. Well, they're going to have to make room for Royce Lewis somewhere. So maybe at least on a roster spot, that becomes Rochelle's. But I will say this. He has been negligibly different than Josh Donaldson with a whole lot less drama. So I will take Urshela in that sense. Yes, drama, drama compared to, but to be fair, honestly, you could tell me that we traded Donaldson for somebody who we no longer have on the team and I still would make that deal. <laughs> All right, well, let's go here. There's a little bit of intrigue still for this season in our Puckets picks. David, let's go to that. Catch him! Puckett's Picks winner. Honestly, it's far more interesting than the AL Central race, if we're going to be honest. But <laughs> unfortunately, Dan does come away with the victory, picking Nick Gordon. And this is, I just, <laughs> it's fine. Whatever. It's just really frustrating that you pick Nick Gordon and you come away with the victory I in a five-game series. I did pick third, to be fair, right? And I also did text you guys, you and Hoags, I think after game two, that was like, hey, I think I'm ready to concede Puckett's Picks. But then Nick Gordon came back and finished Super strong. He gets me 11 points, and you guys with Miranda and Correa each get four. Quite ridiculous. So that brings the season standings. Unfortunately, me and Dan are in a tie for the lead at 16 wins apiece. The listeners are at 14, so certainly not out of it. And then the point totals just for you, Dan. Dan has 251. The listeners have 212. And I have 205. And we got five series left. So it really is up for grabs here. It, it really could be. And I hate to say it, but my goodness, if this does go to a points tie break, I'm going <laughs> to rip out my hair, I think, Dan. <laughs> All right, let's go into our, our Beast versus Bench. Beast versus Bench. Is losing fun? Is losing fun. Yeah, so if you're new to the show, folks, Beast versus Bench, we each pick a player who we thought performed the best and deserves the Beast moniker, and the player that we felt would be better off on the bench for this last series, and the Twins would have perhaps won a game or two if they weren't playing. Well, we can make an argument for your, for your bench. I think that actually <laughs> might be true. Um, how about you start off here with your Beast? Yeah, so I'm going to give it to Walner, and the only reason why is because he had his season debut, he performed well, and none of the blame for this season can be put upon him. So, And I didn't really want to give it to anybody else, Dan. I, that's how I felt about this series. I didn't feel like I wanted to give the beast to anybody else on this team who played so, so terribly in a series that, honestly, it was their season. Like, I just don't understand how you can play this poorly in a series that this is truly whether or not the last four weeks of your life are going to matter. Well, I will get to that with my bench. I do want to say about Walner, how cool is it you hit your home run, the first one of your career, off of Shane Bieber? That's fantastic. Yeah, well, and I do have a question about that, too, because he got the ball back from the fan, he and did. it said that they, they traded bats and balls, but the guy had two bats. How much you want to bet one of those wasn't Walner signature on that bat? I bet he was the If I was the fan, wouldn't you do that, though? Yeah, I'll take a signed bat from you and from Correa. Thank you. Um, so for me, I'm actually going to go with Joe Ryan again, and I, I say this, obviously, not just because he won game four, um, and that was great. But for all the, the moping that he gave in his last start, to come out and throw seven and two-thirds in a game, I don't know that it, it really mattered at that point, right? The twin season, it's pretty much over at that point. But to come out and play the way he did, he's had such a remarkable season for a rookie starter. One of the best rookie starting seasons of all of, of Twins history. Yes, it's been a very good outing. I'm still mad about the pouty face from his uh, when he got pulled from the no-hitter. But yes, he <laughs> did have a very good outing this time. It deserves recognition. I do think that Hoags, our fill-in host, is likely laughing himself to sleep at Dan picking a starting pitcher for his beast though he went in a five he, game he series so many innings though. in a five game series nonetheless Dan he played more innings seemingly than well certainly any pitcher the twins the problem is they just they have so few guys left I gotta take any guy who has a, a, an exemplary series anyway well, who, who's on your bench here so I give it to Palacios because yeah. honestly Dan I just can't I just can't that guy has kicked so many balls around the infield and he goes 0 for 10 with five strikeouts and he had two errors in this series one of which literally lost the game my goodness if there's anybody deserving of the bench moniker now there were other guys at fault certainly but my goodness when you can have maybe two of these losses pinned on one player if that's not the bench i don't know who is and here's the thing if you are a utility infielder who's only up there because 
because of injuries, you need to be able to field. Like if there's one thing, you have to be reliable in the field, and he has been anything but. Yeah, it's really frustrating. Like we talked about, like all you need to do here is not make errors or dumps, right? Like just try your best, make wise plays and good decisions. And it just doesn't seem like any of the guys that the twins have called up outside of Jake Cave apparently have the ability to do that. Well, like you can literally have a zero batting average on this team and stay on the roster if you're Caleb Hamilton. I How that man doesn't have a baseball, he hasn't have a major league hit yet. How is that? How has he been on the team for more than a month and you've not mustered one hit how many at bats though like it's truly like i mean it's only like 10 they do everything they can to make sure he doesn't take it at bat though they again they pinch ran him for gary sanchez again in this series if there's one thing that they want to do to bring the fans out i will attend every twins game for the rest of the season if him and sanchez have a foot race at the beginning of one of them can we get sandy leone in on that too like i would love to see the twins three catchers because it's so important right now to have three catchers on this team i may question the speed differential between Gary Sanchez and Caleb Hamilton. But there is no question that Sandy Leon would be in a distant third in that race, Dan. He could be more spry than you think, Koopas. All right. He's like that fridge guy at the minor <laughs> league games who's like the, the, the chubby freeze version. You just never know. Sandy Leon just never gets a shot. Um, who, uh, who do you got on your bench, Dan? Well, this is a little bit of Hoagsian, but I'm going to go with the injury bug. So... Because who else can I pick here besides from Palacios? This team Rocco. has been, well, maybe there's that, but he's always there on the bench. Um, how has this team, like when Sonny Gray left and even Arise is dealing with something now, like they have Carlos Correa is healthy. Maybe Jose Miranda. Like is anybody on this team healthy? It is it is remarkable. Maybe the trainer needs to be on the bench. How, how can you be a Major League Baseball team and have this many injuries? It does seem like it's been a pretty consistent flow of injuries for this Twins team for a couple of years. It's not new this year, certainly. And it does make you start to question a little bit of all of these methods of like, you know, Rocco like kind of being laissez-faire about a lot of things. Well... Do you need to be tougher a little bit on these guys or do you need to just like do something different? I just when you've had what the second most games lost to injuries in the major leagues. And ironically, I think the other team was the Rays, which is the team that Baldelli came from. Like maybe there's something flawed in the way that the Rays and the Twins handle injuries and and just the wellness of their players. Lack of stretching, I think, Dan. Well, they got to stretch more. I was never good at that in gym class either. So maybe maybe that's the missing piece. Um, We're already talking about Rocco. We should go into the next segment. Rocco's Rewind. So here's the deal, Dan. We talked about Rocco and his management of his staff. And I think one thing that Rocco needs to do in this offseason is he needs to find a pitching coach who will explain to pitchers that they will be executed if they give up hits on 0-2 counts. Because, Dan, this is getting ridiculous. It's like every big hit for the Guardians came with two strikes this series. It's like, stay away from them. Like, you should not be giving them something to hit. It just drives me nuts. And obviously, with the departure of Johnson as the season progressed, That clearly had an impact, but maybe I just didn't notice it as much when Johnson was here. But my goodness, the last few series, it's just like if you have two strikes on a guy and no balls, play around a little bit for crying out loud. Throw a breaking ball outside the zone. Throw a high fastball. Like make them work you can't you can't just throw something right over the middle of the plate i agree and it, and that is it is painful to watch those plays yeah in game one bottom seven jacks threw an o2 pitch to rosario there was like a high fastball that rosario just shot up the middle and it's like dude what are you doing well glenn perkins has talked about this on on some of the telecasts where if you're gonna miss you, you gotta miss right yeah right? You, you have to miss outside the zone um i'm gonna pick on <laughs> the other side and and I have not been Hilberto Celestino's biggest fan, nor have no. you. Like, if no. there's one thing we agree on, it's that we don't like Hilberto. Um, but but I wonder, how is Rocco not getting more out of him? And, and there's not a particular play, per se, in this series, but the guy doesn't hustle. The guy doesn't necessarily know how many outs there are. And I'm, I'm sorry, but, like, this guy, he's a prospect you're really trying to build on. And maybe Hilberto is just one of many guys that I'm just a little bit frustrated with Rocco. But, like, can't you push this guy a little bit? Can't he get better? And maybe this is the crux of my argument. Hilberto Celestino has not gotten better at the things that he is bad at. And that is what's frustrating to me. And I think that is managerial there to a point. Well, he's very Eddie Rosario 
in that way where Eddie had some Easy bonehead there. plays. Can you, I don't know that we can pull out that name. I don't think Gilberto has earned a reference to Eddie Rosario. <laughs> I will say that he is very much like Eddie Rosario when he was with the Twins. Oh my gosh, you're doing <laughs> it again. That, in that Eddie would often make some plays that were very questionable and a lot of them had to do with his mentality. And clearly that's the case with Celestino because I think that as a skill player, he has a lot of skill and a lot to offer this baseball team. But if you can't get your head right and you can't be focused enough in the game to know the count, to know how many outs they are, to know what where the ball needs to be thrown into the infield, that's a problem. But here's the thing. Eddie made up for that, at least to a degree. And and we can quibble this a little bit. I just bit. assumed that you were going to talk about Celestino. <laughs> and no, no, got to go back to the Eddie defense. No, I forgot I because, forgot who I was talking to for a moment there. Because, because Eddie makes a pitcher wonder if he can throw the ball anywhere <laughs> where Eddie will not swing at it and possibly hit a home run, right? And, and Hilberto does not instill any of those questions into a pitcher. Hilberto is not Eddie. Can, I just... <laughs> backtrack a little bit there Kufus. oh this is my favorite i never i mean uh, granted i know that you'll defend eddie at all costs but i didn't realize that this would be the button that would get you to just like <laughs> hang on we need to take a few minutes and just dissect what you've just said about my boy eddie <laughs> all right can we let's move forward here to the minnesota moment minnesota moment Here's my thing. At what point in this series, Dan, did you think the season was over? <laughs> because for me, it was a very specific moment. And it doesn't even seem like in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't even seem like that important. But for me, it was Miranda grounding into a double play in game two, the top of the first. It was in that moment that I'm like, it's all she wrote. <laughs> this is the season is done. And so it just felt like, yeah, that's about right. Like they, they just can't get runs across no matter what happens. And the Guardians, for whatever reason, are bulletproof when they're playing the Twins. If the top five of this lineup right now can't do anything, they're not going to do anything, right? I mean, like, no. that's you, you've got to rise through Urshela, and that's about it. And and that's not, like, you would love to have Gordon and Urshela as your as your eight and nine hitters in this lineup, right? Yeah. And and then you've got yourself a competitive lineup, and they just, they just don't have that right now. Yeah, so what do you have for your moment? Hopefully it's more uplifting than mine. Well, first I should answer kind of your question. So I would say, uh, yes, to me, it, it, it wasn't until the bottom of the 15th when the Guardians won, because, because I do think if they can win that game in game three, and then win the next two you know you still have a little bit of hope right because then what are you back three at that point yeah so there is a chance there but uh so that was my moment um for me it was it was walner getting doubled off in the top of the six with the bases loaded because it was a rookie mistake on a ball hit hard and let me tell you the twins i feel like they've hit the ball pretty hard this season overall but they've also had a number of mental mistakes and some of them i think are just guys playing when they probably should not yet be playing in the majors or they're playing in higher leverage situations than you would want a rookie like Walner to be like I love to see Walner up I think it's been great I'm going to talk about this in the next segment but he shouldn't be in that position in a key moment like that that you're counting on him exactly or any time that Pagan was on the mound this season it totally I mean there were just there were just so many times when it's like that's not the guy you want in that situation if you are a team that's going to win a playoff series certainly all right well, let's go to the musings here and I'll keep going on Walner I just don't know how it can get any better. Mauer's Musings. So, Kubis, I, I look at this lineup and I look at the outfield right now. So, if we could. In Game 5, this outfield con is consisting of Celestino, Cave, and Walner. And you've got Mark Contreras as kind of the fourth outfielder. Ridiculous. Why is Walner not up earlier after he was having such a great month and a half or so at AAA? And you got to figure, yeah, he's not eligible for the postseason roster because he wasn't on the 40-man by the beginning of the month. But surely he gives you a better chance to get to the postseason. I don't understand this. Yeah, at this point, you take almost anybody besides the guys you were throwing out there who, who have proven themselves unable to handle a daily role. Totally. And I am like, is this a service time manipulation by the Twins? Like, are they trying to look to the next season? I, it's the only way that I can reasonably think that you're not really pushing for this year. You're thinking you want Walner for next year. It, you cannot tell me if you're a Twins front office person with, with a straight face that Mark Contreras gives the team a better chance to win than Matt Walner. I mean, the mustache helps though, right? It does. It's a great mustache. But like, cave yes. But I can't, I don't, I mean, I can buy Celestino, right? Because he does have his ups and he's a little bit more of a known quantity. But Caleb Hamilton, 
like yeah. Billy Hamilton. At that point, you can cut bait with Billy Hamilton and bring up Walner. Yeah, let him go to some team that wants to sign him to use him as a pinch runner late. In the there game. you go. Exactly. They're just they were not in a position. They didn't have the luxury to have Billy Hamilton on this roster any longer. And there he is. The shot in the arm the twins needed, Dan. <laughs> Billy. He Hamilton. had one stolen base, right? It was a great steal. That really a lot of energy. And then he got thrown out at third a couple of pitches later. Yeah, so Hoag's actually, he asked, is this the most disappointing season as a Twins fan? And I would say no. The biggest reason being that I think that the injuries have played such a large role this season that this team clearly underachieved what they would have achieved had they been healthy this season. So it's disappointing in sort of a, oh, that's kind of a bummer. But at the same time, we can be really mad that the Twins lost these games against the Guardians. But what did you just explain, Dan? There are so many guys on this roster currently that wouldn't be if this team had any semblance of health. So I would say no, not the most disappointing season I've experienced as a Twins fan. No, I think I would agree with you in that sense because I would be more disappointed if Buxton and Polanco and Jeffers and Sano, like all these guys were still in the lineup. <laughs> so yes. No. And then I thought, <laughs> I mentioned him and I thought Kufus is going to laugh at me for mentioning yeah. Miguel Sano, but I will. That's what we were missing. That's what we were missing was Miguel Sano. <laughs> if he had hit the 41 home runs that I predicted that he was going to hit, this is a playoff team. Kufus. I mean, he was in the best shape of his life, Dan. <laughs> All right, well, a couple more segments here. Let's uh, let's grade this. Series grades. It's an F. I don't understand how you could give them a grade <laughs> anything other than an F. They couldn't just win one game. Like, that's why this is an F. It doesn't matter how they lost them in this instance. It's just, this is a pretty black and white one to me, Dan. You, you didn't do the bare minimum of what you needed to do, which was win the series. So this is an F. Far and away, an F. I don't understand what you're doing over there. I, I gave him a D out of pity, I think, because after the first couple games, I just thought, you know what? Look at, again, look at this lineup. Look at this pitching staff. This is a glorified triple team right now that they're putting out there and so i don't even know that they're glorified i mean they they are playing at a higher (laughs) level but calling them glorified i think is too strong of an adjective for my liking dan they're a triple a team in mlb clothing right that's what they are right yeah i'm having trouble piecing it all together if i'm honest (laughs) with you dan all right let's go to herbie's headline i don't know jack it looked like herbeck pulled him off the bag Herbie's headlines. Dan, it's really hard to care about other teams in baseball when the Twins are so sad right now. But Judge is now at 59 home runs. Pujols is at 698. And the last one came in a 6-5 win for the Cards. And then, I I don't know why this is funny, but it was on The Athletic. Twins.com, Dan, has been held by the set of twin brothers for like the (laughs) last like 20 years. And finally, finally, the MLB managed to purchase that domain URL, which is pretty hilarious i didn't know that i remember when this was happening like with the minnesota wild and there was like a like a, a store in duluth or something on the north shore somebody could correct me that was wild.com and they had a devil of a time wresting that away from them there how did the how did these people hang on to twins.com for 20 years i don't well you just wonder like what was their asking price like it had to be <laughs> astronomical for the mlb not to just be like oh yeah sure um well what i also wanted to talk about was you know i don't know if we've noticed david but there are other baseball teams playing in the majors other than these mediocre central teams nah. um so right now so the guardians then are the third division winner and they are eight games behind the yankees uh 17 behind the astros but then they're also behind some wild card teams so they're they're three back from toronto i'm estimating here this might be slightly off three up back from toronto a couple back from tampa and one back from seattle so my question to you is do you think that the that the guardians should be that this three team this third division winner should automatically host in this new three game series format yeah you know it's one of those questions that's always a question right like in the NFL it was the question for a long time because yeah. so many divisions were so poor I, I I don't know you know me Dan I don't think much before I talk right <laughs> like like words words just come out of my mouth like sometimes when I'm sitting with someone and they're quiet I just think what what are you doing like like you must be doing math like it's the only logical thing like in your head you're doing some numbers or something because you're not vocalizing every thought that comes into your head but so for this Dan I honestly I need some time to think about this because I I'm curious the way that I would examine this is if it was the other way would I be like well hang on now that division winner deserves to be the higher seed I don't really know if I'd be upset that way or if I should be upset this way what are your thoughts well I was thinking while you were speaking that's normally what people are doing when they're not talking is they're formulating their thoughts Um, never done that before Dan. 
I actually, I wasn't going to say this before, but now you've convinced me otherwise. I think I do like that the, that the division winner does get to host this because we have this imbalanced schedule. It's so hard. Even when they change it next year, they're still going to be imbalanced. I think we need to value the division winner. And at the same time, we're not talking about the fourth team. We're talking about the sixth team, right? Yeah. So I, I do think that that does matter. I would have more problem with it if we're just talking about one wildcard team's chance. Um, but I think it's okay. And you let the four and the five duke it out because um, you're probably, you know, the, the wildcard team that's most likely to win is obviously the four. So I'm okay with it. And I will I will root for the Guardians in the playoffs if they're the team. I'm, I'm okay with rooting for them, Kufus. Why why that ugly face? Nah, you can't I'll, do it? No, I'll, I'll probably cheer for the Rays and I'll cheer for, I'll cheer for the Mets even. I think I'd be okay with that. I don't know. There's a lot of teams that I would cheer for that are not the Guardians. Well, I'm okay with it because, I, again, I, I feel like the Guardians were just kind of the better team. Now, by the end of the season, I think they were the better team. They were playing better. That said, if the Mariners get in, I will happily root for those Mariners. They have been long suffering. Next episode, let's make a note. Let's talk about that to see who, or let's make a ranking of who we cheer for, knowing that the Twins aren't going to make the postseason. Yeah, I say we're going to have to make that choice. Uh, let's go into Puckett's Picks. And we'll see you tomorrow. Puckett's Picks. Dan, these picks matter more than every game the Twins will play the rest of the this season. This is the most important segment of the podcast now, David, really. It's not even close. Like, we could we could not record the rest of it and only do the winners and then the picks for next episode, and I think people would still listen. So who are the listeners going with here? The listeners are going to take Nick Gordon off the board, if you can believe it. Well, I can, because he just won me Puckett's Picks by seven points. David, he's on a roll. For how terrible a game that that guy has had. He goes up and down in this series. But anyway, the listeners take Gordon. I'm obviously going to stick with my rule. I'm going to take Correa because he's available. And that leaves you the rest of that lineup, Dan. Who are you going to (laughs) take? It's just like, it's Miranda, and then you could take a chance. (laughs) Arise, Um, arise. We're kind of... That's true. Arise, and he's playing, and he's actually, we, kudos to Arise. He's not healthy, and he's out there giving it his all. But I also think that could change. I think they might just yeah. sit Luis Arise down. Um, so you know what? What the heck? I'm going to go with Matt Walner because he's <laughs> going to play. He's got nothing to lose, and now he had that dumb to make up for in Game 5. So I'm going to go with Walner. Speaking of nothing to lose, that's what Provis made that argument for the Guardians getting into the postseason that, like, they're playing with house money. Nobody expects them to do anything. So anything that they can do in the postseason, I think, will be an unexpected surprise for the city of cleveland all right david well with that heading into this royal series i'm going to send us out folks if you like what you hear please tell a friend you can follow us on twitter at men for the win you can find our men for the win facebook page as well we're also on youtube make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you're notified when new episodes are available and if you could leave us a rating or a like that'd be great thanks for listening and as always go twins That'll wrap up another episode of Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the Twins. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, go Twins!